So I would like to welcome all of you and to especially welcome Susan, who is in Massachusetts, I think, right? Yep. Um, and I have this little bio for her. When Susan realized that she had been doing calligraphy for 40 years and still felt the need to apologize for her work, I suspect some of us also feel the same way. She decided to look back on her journey and see if she could figure out why. In this illustrated talk, she shares her early days of learning from books, important teachers, Jackie Sparr and Yan Rees, Jenny Hunter Grote and Mike Gold, her pivotal work using her own text, which led to her deep involvement in the book arts and her return to calligraphy with new freedom and spirit. She hopes that this talk will encourage you to reflect on your own creative journey. There is much that we can learn from our own stories. Susan's involvement in the arts includes roles as artist, teacher, speaker, writer, designer, and publisher. Her artist books are in the library collections of the Museum of Modern Art, Wellesley College, Yale University, and Bowdoin College, and have been exhibited across the US and Canada and in Korea. Her work has been featured in Letter Arts Review, Bound and Lettered, and Somerset Studio, and numerous books, including 500 handmade books and 1,000 artist books. She is the author of the independently published calligraphy, How I Fell In, Out, and In Love Again, Art Lessons, Reflections from an Artist's Life. The Spirit Books Catalog and Handmade Books for a Healthy Planet, as well as four books for Scholastic Professional Books. Um, Susan will be talking about her book, which we have in our library. Okay, over to you, Susan. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, thanks, everybody, for taking time in this difficult time. I really appreciate your coming to spend some time with me this evening. The original plan was that I would have been with you in person last month, which would have meant I would have gotten to see New Mexico for the first time. Um, that hasn't happened, but um, maybe next year. Uh, so this is a talk, as Elizabeth mentioned, about kind of based on my book. And so in 2018, I realized that I had been doing calligraphy for 40 years. And I thought, one, as Elizabeth said, the question about apologizing for your work, that came into it. And then I also decided it would be a good thing to kind of reflect um, it was a kind of a marker and I wanted to do something. So I did 40 blog posts about um, going back and kind of finding old pictures and images and um, just collecting a lot of old work, looking at it, sharing it. And then the following year, I decided that I should turn it into a book. So my original thought was that it was going to be really simple. I was just going to take the blog posts and make a book, but that didn't work. It, it just really didn't hold together. So it was a lot of work to do. Um, and I publish it myself, which is, I've done that for other books. Um, and part of my thing is one, I don't think I would find a publisher Two, I don't have the patience to try to find the publisher and three, I like to do everything my way. So by doing it myself, I get to do that. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be sharing, um, so the kind of the storyline of the talk is my, um, my talking about this whole, about how I learned about the whole idea of apology and then just sort of the path I took to find what I consider to be my own voice in calligraphy. So right now I'm going to share the screen. And so from here on, it's going to be, you're just going to be, it's like you were sitting in an illustrated slide talk. So I started doing calligraphy when I was in high school. Um, and a friend of mine had learned calligraphy in class, in an art class. And so he shared some of he shared with me the speedball textbook and speedball nibs and a um, and some ink. And I sort of was on my way. So at that time, I was in love with the speedball and grocer's old English alphabet. And it was something that, I mean, it didn't matter if it made any sense for what the quote was or what I was doing. This is what I did. And I have to say that I don't really consider myself of learning calligraphy at all at that point, because I didn't... Um, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know anything about basic principles. I didn't know. I just tried to copy what I saw on the page. 
And this is an example of that. So I, I did it in high school. I kind of would dabble here and there. And then 10 years later, a friend from high school remembered I did it, asked if I would do something for a friend. I got out my pen and my ink and I started to play around and I said yes. And then I just really kind of, I really kind of fell in love. And it was handy because I was unemployed at the time and I was collecting unemployment. So I had a lot of time to work. I was in my late twenties at that point. I had a lot of time to practice and I realized fairly soon in for me that this, the speedball textbook really didn't kind of, it wasn't enough. It didn't have enough background. It didn't have enough. I couldn't seem to get enough understanding about why I was doing things. So I started to try to find other books. And one of the first ones I, I used was the Italic Way to Beautiful Handwriting by Fred Eager. And I love the idea that it was about handwriting and it was about calligraphy so that I could be learning something that I could use all the time, but then it was also kind of calligraphic. And this is something that I did early on. So I had been an English major in college. And when I finished, when I graduated, I was really just so fed up with analyzing literature that I had no interest in kind of pursuing it, or I was really frustrated with that. So when it, so one of the attractions for doing calligraphy was that I could spend time with words that I loved and I didn't have to analyze them. I didn't have to think about them. I could just kind of just enjoy writing them out. And um, I think that that's one of the things that really kind of helped me. So I never, I never really got that frustrated because I was always, I always had that thing like, oh, I'm going to spend time with the words I love. Um, so then I went around kind of searching out other books and it was just so looking back, I realized how different things were then. I mean, there was no internet, there was no finding books was not easy. You had to go to bookstores and they might have one book on calligraphy and it took me a while to kind of put things together. But one of my favorite books was written letters by Jackie Sfarn. And uh, I loved all her hints and I loved her alphabet. And so that kind of leads me into one of the things, and this is something that I, this was my handout for a, um, when I was teaching calligraphy at Riviere College. Um, but I think that thinking about the whole thing of why you have to apologize, I think that calligraphy, I know a lot of artists and I feel that calligraphers are the most self-critical of all that I've met. And I think the reason is that when we are working, when we're learning, we are learning from an exemplar most often, and we are learning to try to, to work to a model, an ideal. And we're also being asked to constantly compare what we're doing and kind of compare it to the model and see where it, where it holds up. And so that whole thing of like just comparing, just always being in a position where you're comparing your work to something that you think is better, I think there is something inherent in that that does make it hard to let go of the critical quality of being, being really critical. Um, so the other thing was that a couple of the books I had, I think the books I had, people took it just incredibly seriously. So one of my favorite books was Writing and Illuminating and Lettering by Edward Johnston. And in the biography of biographical note at the beginning, Noel Rook wrote about Johnston. He held that in all work, truth must be sought. Beauty is an ultimate grace, which will be conferred upon the craftsman's work if it is well done. But the idea that it was serious. And then another book, which not so much for learning the letters, but the philosophy of it was The Mystic Art of Written Forms by Friedrich Neugebauer. And then in his foreword, he says, personal lettering is the subtlest detector of one's substance and character. What distinguishes this person is his or her obligation to a duty that strives for organic order. Lettering is order. It is a means to a higher consciousness. So there was certainly this sense in, in kind of the learning that I was doing was that this was really serious business and it was important that it was done well. Um, so that I think put some weight onto the whole thing that made it hard. But the biggest thing, the reason why I was carrying the shadow around for 40 years was the fact that I put myself out there too soon, I think. In some, in some ways, I think that it's, it's such a hard decision of when you kind of put yourself out into the world and say like, I'm a calligrapher, or this is what I do. Um, but there was no question that I did it, in my opinion, too soon. And part of that is because you're, you know, you're training your hand and you're training your eye. And I think your eye kind of 
sometimes it takes a little while to catch up so that I was doing lettering and I had been practicing. So what happened to me was that I was collecting unemployment. I was practicing all the time. I was probably putting in 30, 40 hours a week practicing. And then, then at some point, unemployment ran out. And then it's like, what am I going to do? I don't really want to go find a job because I love spending my days doing calligraphy. So I think I'll go ask um, people if um, I'll go try to find people to pay me to do calligraphy. And um, so, but I really wasn't, you know, so at the time I thought I was pretty good, but then it sort of two or three months later, I'm looking at it and thinking like, this really isn't so good. But by that time, I'm already out there and it's kind of too late. So all it did was just make me work incredibly hard, but also sort of carry around this, this shadow that was going to tell me that my work wasn't as good as it. So I didn't mess around. I did commercial work. I went and got jobs from people. And then I also happened to meet a group of artists. And so I ended up in an artist co-op and I was exhibiting my work. So I'm just going to show you. These are a couple of the kind of, this is, I think, probably the first job I did for anyone. And I mean, the lettering is not horrible, but it's, it's certainly not great. And I lived in the, near Lowell, Massachusetts. I did a lot of work there. And in that time, that was before personal computers. So there was no desktop publishing. And so if you were in an office or you did something, if you wanted to do something, you could either have it typewritten on your typewriter, or you could go to a printer and have a typeset, or you could come to me and I would letter it for you. So I think I got a lot of work that there was just more work out there and I didn't charge that much. So I did it for all kinds of things. So this was something the local newspaper had done for a Golden Glo Gloves boxing match, inviting people to dinner before it. And then this was a menu I did. And this was my favorite thing to do was to do invitations for friends who were having art shows. And again, I could do it easier, faster, cheaper than anybody than if they went to a printer. So, um, and everything was all hand lettered because if I had tried to do, wanted to do, put any type in it, again, I would have had to go to a typesetter, have it printed, take the time to do it. Um, and so I did, I, I did work probably for about 10 years. Um, I did a lot of, of commercial work. And then, uh, okay, so now my, okay, here we go. Okay, so I also did artwork. And so in the beginning, I did a lot of things based on medieval manuscripts that I would just copy um, pictures that I saw in pages. So I, I'm not sure it was an R, but the design of those, um, of the white vine initials, I'm sure was pretty much a straight copy from the book. And then I'm just going to show you some work. This is sort of in the first phase of my doing calligraphy when I, I was just kind of all in and super serious about it. Um, this is a quote from Montaigne. Um, this is, and this is very typical of what I considered like the work I was doing. So I was taking written texts and I was trying to interpret them as, as best as I could to enhance the experience of, of reading the quotes. This is a, a poem by a friend of mine. Um, then I had a show at the Concord Free Public Library in Concord, Massachusetts, which is where Thoreau and Emerson and Louisa May Alcott and Transcendentalists were from. So this is one I did. I wrote beans with a a toothbrush and acrylic paint. And then the line from Walden was, I was determined to know beans in gouache and with a pen. Um, this is Margaret Fuller, um, who was one of that group. Um, she's a really interesting person. If you're not familiar with her, there's a couple of really good biographies of her. Um, this is from Thoreau. It is life near the bone where it is the sweetest. And I took a workshop with Carl Georg Herfer, who was a, um, who was a German calligrapher. And he did, he didn't use a rapidograph pen. He used the, the plastic bottle that the ink came in and he wrote with that. So after, I, after the workshop, I had to experiment with that. And the, the kind of bone there is done with um, whiteout from, right from the bottle. And so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the teachers I had and some books that I encountered. And so the first, so I started in 1978. I did not, um, I did not take a class. I did. So, and when I started, I wasn't, I can't remember whether I couldn't find a class or I had the speedball textbook. So I thought, Hey, you can learn from a book. I think I'll do it that way. And the other thing I didn't mention too, is the whole thing about being an English major that, um, on the one hand, I was tired of analyzing the texts, 
But I think that that analytical mind that I developed doing calligraphy and um, both in the terms of analyzing the literature and then the process of writing and, and it's kind of like you have a red pen and, and kind of editing and kind of trying to prove your writing all the time. I think that that really prepared me for being able to, to, to work with calligraphy on my own. So I worked on my own for four years. I didn't take a class or workshop. I didn't really know any other calligraphers. And then I just sort of jumped right in and I went to a calligraphy conference in Philadelphia in 1982. And the class I signed up for, the, the set of mornings, was with Jackie Sfarin. And I did it because I loved her book. And the, the calligraphy part of the class was wonderful. But the biggest and most important thing to me was that, that she introduced us to the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And in the book, the beginning of the book, it's, um, Shenru Suzuki says, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the experts, there are few. So the idea is that what you want to bring to your work is this sense of beginner's mind, that you've seen everything fresh for the first time every time you do it. And the, th the biggest thing that she said that had a really big impact on me, which was from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, she said when you're do and he was talking about Zen practice and meditation rather than calligraphy, but the idea, she said, never refer to your work as good or bad. So you don't make a letter and say that's good or that's bad. Because if you make a good one, if you say it's good, then that's going to put pressure on you and you're going to have a really hard time. You can just get all, it's just like you let emotions in there and you're going to get all mixed up. So what Suzuki said was you say to do or not to do. And um, so, so basically, I look at it that you kind of take, you take judgment, kind of moral judgment, judgment that it's a reflection of somehow of a new character, but you just take that all away. So you're much more objective about what you're writing. And I think that that has been very helpful to me. And then the next year I took a workshop with Yayan Reese in New York, the Welsh calligrapher. And again, it was a wonderful workshop in the calligraphy, but the thing that really, really lasted with me was the book Art, The Art Spirit by Robert Henry, which he introduced us to. And Robert Henry was a 20th century artist, early 20th century artist who um, had been studied in Paris and really brought kind of like a much more open and much fresher approach. And so I'm just going to read you one thing that he said, which related to Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. But he, so this is from him. The object which is back of every true work of art is the attainment of a state of being, a state of high functioning, a more than ordinary moment of existence. In such moments, activity is inevitable, and whether it is with brush, pen, chisel, or tongue, it is the result, its result is the byproduct of the state, a trace, a footprint of the state. So again, this idea that you're, that, that you know, we sort of talking about like process being more important than product, and that's exactly what he was saying. It's, it's, it's your engagement in the moment of the doing that is the really important thing. And that was really kind of had an effect on me and was really helpful to me. And so the person who is my most important teacher was Jenny Hunter Grove. And Jenny came to Boston to give a workshop in 1985. And it was on Noton, the Japanese light and dark principle of design. And so it was for a weekend. I took the workshop. It was wonderful. I loved everything in the workshop. And I loved Jenny. And so this was at a time when I was really starting to be restless about calligraphy. I wasn't sure I wanted to keep doing it. I wasn't quite sure where I fit into things, but I felt really, um, I, I felt that it was sort of a failing, a moral failing of character to give it up, that somehow I was being lazy. I just couldn't quite understand why I was doing it. So I wrote to Jenny, so I've never done anything like that before, but I just felt a connection with her. So I wrote her a letter kind of talking about the things and sort of saying like, what do I do? And she wrote me back a six page letter that was just really amazing. And she ended it with, by saying, please keep your soul your own. So it was like, she gave me permission to go and explore and, and try new things and do what I wanted to. And I took a workshop. So that was in 85 and in 88, she ran a retreat workshop at Green Gulch Zen Center, which I went out to. And there I spent a couple of days doing calligraphy. And then I was just really drawn outside. And I spent the rest of the time just kind of playing with sticks and gathering little natural materials and making little environments. And she was 
encourage, like didn't tell me what to do, but was really encouraging about it. And that sort of is a thread that comes into my work later. But so she was really, and I've, I kept in touch with her for the rest, um, for the rest of her life. So actually I had done this before that workshop in Jenny, but in 1985, it was a really kind of a tumultuous year for me. My mother died in January, totally unexpectedly. And then my first child was born in, um, in June. And I kind of wanted to do more personal things with my work. So I did a series called Childbirth Journey. It had um, abstract pastel drawings and lines and calligraphy that were from my journal. And I exhibited at a local art association. And I thought, um, when I, I mean, well, one, it was kind of an, People, some people loved it. Some people were like, I don't know why she's telling me all this stuff. I don't really need to know. And this was before Facebook, before like kind of the whole oversharing thing that's happened. But for some reason, I had this compulsion to do this and share it. But when I brought it home, I didn't want to put it on the wall. I felt like it, it just really was too personal to be something that you looked at all the time. And so what that did was that made me start to think about a more intimate way of my work because I kind of liked this idea that I was going to do things that were more personal. So I was looking for something more intimate and that's what led me to handmade books. And I first started with, so my first step though was to do a, just an eight and a half by 11 black and white version of childbirth journey. So I used pastel um, charcoal, just charcoal for the, for the drawings. And then in the middle of that, those are photocopies of milkweed blossoms because at that time I was really into doing stuff with a photocopier. So I, this is, um, I did a series of lullabies. These are, this is like, I created the collage on paper, but all, all from all of these different natural materials that I had created the imagery on the photocopier. So if you photocopy something, you get all shades of gray, but if you copy a copy and then copy that copy and then copy that copy, if you keep going, eventually everything will, separate into either black or white. And so I really loved, I love the magic of it. I love the way you didn't know exactly what was going to happen. And that was kind of the whole Noton thing. I love the idea of just working with black and white design. So I did a lot of work with that. And the first um, artist book I did actually used calligraphy and used photocopier. So it was, I used one photograph that a friend of mine, Betsy Bolton had taken of Pawtucket Falls and Lowell. It's about Jack Kerouac. And the pages have um, text by me uh, that's written. And then I later did a limited edition book that had it in type. So I was commentary about my thoughts about Jack Kerouac and Lowell and the Merrimack River, and then quotes from Kerouac that were on tracing vellum that then were on top of photographs of Pawtucket Falls. And then that led me to the whole photocopier thing. And then I kind of drifted away from doing lettering in, in my books well, what happened was I started, I decided if I was going to make books, I should learn how to make a hardcover book. And so I got binders board and I covered it. But when I saw that, it was like, I like this just the way it is. I want this to be the pages, not the book. So I made a series of books using the book board as the pages. And then this was using the photocopier again. That was, um, they were lips from the Buddha at Angkor Wat from a photograph. And then I was making an alphabet book, book with my son and we were photocopying our ears for the letter E. And I realized that I had a lot of gray hair. And at this time, I mean, I was thinking a lot about life and death and what's the meaning of it all. And so this was kind of a whole thing about aging and eternity and, you know, that we're eternal, but yet, yet we're finite, but yet we're infinite. Um, so, and when I did this, I was really, um, it was really kind of scary. I felt like I was really out on a limb because it didn't look like other things I saw. But anyway, I, um, kept going and, and I actually won like a big prize in a local show for this book, which really kind of established my, my confidence that I was okay where I was going. But the biggest thing I did, but the big thing was that, and the work that I'm kind of best known for in, in um, the book, artist book world are a series called The Spirit Books. And so those grew out of that time I spent at Green Gulch with Jenny. And also the fact that we had done prune done a whole thing where we pruned tons and tons of shrubbery and bushes and trees. And I had all these sticks and vines and things that I brought into the studio 
And it took me four years to figure out what to do with them. I'd already been making books, but I never thought of making a book. And then one day I just kind of made this. Um, so the whole process, this, I, this thing of something just happening organically without a lot of planning is the way I make all the spirit books. Um, I don't have sketches, I don't have plans, and I just do them. So the idea of them is that they're celebrating the spirit of nature. And I kind of, my statement has something that it's about the inherent spirituality, my experience of the inherent spirituality of nature and, the, um, and books as testaments of faith and belief. So there are books that are all handmade and they rest in cradles of natural materials. And I'm... Um, so I made, this is actually the most, one of the more recent ones and one of the more complicated. But at some point, so I started in 1992. In 2005, I was on number 50. And I decided that that was the end. I was going to stop making them. And I don't know why. It seems like it was pretty arbitrary. And I had no idea how much my identity was tied up in the spirit books. And so I was an absolute lost soul without them. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had no plan. So I took a class in basket making. I took a class in Chinese brush painting. I didn't really like, I, I didn't, wasn't that fond of the Chinese brush painting, but it reminded me that I loved ink and I love paper. So I, that sort of began drawing me back to calligraphy. And this was something, there was a, our um, local net, um, state park has a sculpture show every year, an outdoor temporary sculpture show. So I did this with um, Sumi ink on paper using hemlock. These were hemlock trees and I used needles from that to, to do the writing or bunches of that. And um, it had a lot of technical difficulties. I did a little bit more with that, but I decided that wasn't really a direction I wanted to go. So the next year comes around, there's another outdoor sculpture at Maudsley. I have no idea what to do because I'm lost. And it was like, well, I remember I really like words and I like calligraphy. So I think maybe I'll, you know, just as like a safety net, I'll go back and try that. So I did, this was one with, um, so John Greenleaf Whittier, the 19th century poet, he lived in this area and he used to spend time there. So I did lines of his, um, that on strips of paper that I put on the trees. And then this was another one. So I did for several years, I did it. And it was always like, Whew, I can always do, take a breathe, <laughs> breathe. I can always do something with some lettering. Um, but that was what began to get me back into calligraphy. And then that comes to the last person to, to a workshop with Mike Gold. And it was, in, it was called Contemporary Scripts. I took it, was, took it through Mass Scribes. And I hadn't taken a workshop in like 20 years. So I was kind of nervous about it. But Mike, I had corresponded with Mike because he had studied with Jenny. And he, we, when he was writing an appreciation of her after, her after her passing for Letter Arts Review, we had some correspondence um, over some photographs. And so I thought, well, if, if he's kind of in the Jenny school and comes from Jenny, he's going to be a good person to study from. And so the workshop, I didn't really do that much. There wasn't that much that I really hadn't kind of played around with before, but it, it, I felt like it really gave me permission. And what I liked about it, going back to kind of the early days was he put it all in context of Edward Johnston. So he said, Edward Johnston, when he looked at a manuscript, he would study it for its slope, for the, the order, the ductus, so the order that the, the letters were made in, the interspacing in between the lines, all of the things that he would use. And in his case, looking for consistency, Mike was like, we'll take all those things and we'll shift them. We'll play around. We'll, we'll, we'll play with them instead of, of using them in a consistent way. So after that workshop, the next, um, that was in November, and this was the, the holiday card I made that year. And this kind of led to what I kind of consider my signature style, I guess. Um, and it happened because this quote has all these double L um, combinations. And when I originally did it, I did them all as lowercase letters, as small letters. They were all small L's, and they just were chunky and blocky, and they just really kind of messed up the whole thing. So that's what I, and the way I kind of worked was I was just writing it over and over and over again. And like kind of, so at some point I decided that the solution to that could be to combine caps and, uh, caps and small letters. And so that's what I did there. And that's kind of become what I use very often. Um, and the other thing that drew me back to calligraphy was the words. So now, um, 
now I'm, I'm happy to just write the words. And, and I actually, one of the things I didn't tell you about Jenny, that really, one of the things she said that really had an influence on me was that she, she gave a talk when we the first night we were at Green Gulch. And she talked about that there are two kinds of artists. There are interpretive artists and there are originating artists. And her examples were Margot Fontaine, the ballerina and Martha Graham, the choreographer and, and modern dancer. And what I realized when she said that it was like, that was what made sense to me. It's like, I don't want to be Margot Fontaine anymore. I don't want to be the interpreter. I want to be the originator. And so that kind of led me on that path. And so, but now I feel like when I was doing the calligraphy in an interpretive way, there was a sense that I really wanted to enhance the power of the words, but there was also a sense that I wanted to put my stamp on it. And I wanted, I, I was, I wanted to put some of myself in it. And now, I mean, I'm putting myself in the fact that I'm choosing them and the writing I'm doing, but I'm happy to not do anything else, to just do the letters. And the other thing that's drawn me back to words is with the spirit books, I feel that they're very separate. They're kind of like a sanctuary. They're a separate space. And I feel like they don't engage in the world with all of the problems that we have right now in the same way that words do. And so if I want to go to the spirit books, they are kind of a they're an ex exercise in removing myself a little bit from the world. Whereas I'm going to words is something that can kind of sustain me to be part of the world. Uh, if, if that makes sense. So the other thing I'm interested in, so that idea when I came home from that childbirth journey exhibit and I didn't want to do framed work, I don't want to do calligraphy that goes in a frame anymore. So I decided I would, one of the things, and I want to kind of play around this, so I decided that I would work big. So this was an exhibit I had at a gallery in Hartford, Connecticut, and it was done with, um, so I did the, all the lettering in the gallery live with a, an audience. So I kind of put everything together, got there, set up, and then I did all the banners and they got hung on the wall. And so when I did this, so I don't, following on kind of the way I, with the spirit books, like I don't do... I don't sketch anything out. I don't really have a plan when I start, but I, I mean, I didn't just show up at the gallery and write those. So I practice and try to figure things out, but I was doing everything the same scale. So I did a lot of practice on newsprint and then I came to, to this. And so I, initially I thought I was, I was started out using a much thicker brush and I started using kind of more traditional lettering, but there just wasn't enough room for your eye to move around. I felt on the page. And I felt like when I was doing these, there were 10 pieces and I needed to do something to make sure that people would continue to engage. Cause you could walk through the exhibit. I mean, you could read it in probably two or three minutes. You could just whip through it, but that seems like not enough. <laughs> it seemed like it needed more. So I wanted something that would draw your eye in and give you, give you some space to do it. And um, so again, I just, started just writing and writing and writing until this is this is what I ended up with and I think that's very influenced by Mike um, and then those banners went to another gallery at a retreat center and then I did the two the narrow bat the narrow banners on the pe on the posts I did at that gallery with with an audience and those are more a little different style and kind of more traditional. There was a lot less room to move around. And I think they were only 12 inches wide, maybe 18. Um, so, and then this is another, so I really love the idea of doing installations. Um, I'm lo always looking for more opportunities. This was at a property that was on, it's owned by the KPM museum and it's really kind of amazing. It was built, I think in the 1700s and it's a very raw space kind of, distressed um, space. It's really pretty magical. So I was very excited to be doing an exhibit in space. And what I did was I went to the KPN Museum Archives. This is in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And I found a couple of journals by a, by a girl named Hannah S. Babson from 1847 to 1950 or 50, I mean, 1850, 51. And she, she was, I think she was 12 when it started. And so I took passages from her journal and there were four rooms like this and I used tracing paper and I used a marker and I just, I, my husband, and I went to the gallery and I just kind of wrote there and he would hang it up and we did it um, kind of on the spot. The thing, the thing about it was that it was a one day exhibit. So it was up for four hours. 
So it was a lot of work for four hours. And then when I went to take it down, it was really damp in the space and the paper was all wrinkled. And so I just put them all in the recycling bag, put them in a bag and just recycled them. So the good thing that I have figured out is that it's really good to hire a good photographer to photograph it if you're, it's only going to last for four hours. Um, and then my latest work, I won't call it political, but it is definitely related to this time we're in. So this was a, a little booklet that I did for the Women's March, uh, the first Women's March in 2017. And I, I, the centerpiece of it was this, was a quote from Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. So, and I, I made these for friends. I made copies. There were five busloads that went from Newburyport to Boston. And I made copies for everybody on the buses and I put it online. So it was shared a lot, which um, I felt really good about. Um, but so that quote kind of stayed with me. And then that led me to um, a series called Words for Our Time. There are eight pieces in it. And it started with the Audre Lord quote. And the lettering on this, like the strength of it, strength is um, if that person was overlooking my shoulder, the one I have to apologize for, I would possibly think I should apologize for strength. But, part, but it was partly intentional that I really wanted this to feel urgent. I wanted to feel like I did not have time to, to do really precise letters. I just kind of had to get it out because that's how I felt. And so it's, it's, the thing is quite brown. I had them photographed with the light behind it, which gives it that color. But the original was much paler. And so I wrote on all, every quote and everything is, it's all from one piece of paper, torn into pieces, um, torn into pieces, all of the different pieces were written and then they're all sewed together. So this is just a close up so that you can see the stitches. So my idea was that you're going to take it and we're going to, we're, we're kind of being split apart and part of the healing process is to sew it back together. Um, and then this is, this is another one. Um, and then, so then I'm just These are just sort of a few things here. So one of the things with calligraphy for me now is I think I really have taken to heart Robert Henry, Zen mind. I'm really, I love doing calligraphy now and I I love the doing probably more than what the result is. Um, and I love the doing. I feel like after all those years of really hard work that I can now just feel really joyful when I'm doing it. So, and the thing is, so I don't want to frame it and I don't want to do anything with it. So a lot of, so, so a lot of the things I do, I will, some of the things I will do, I will put it onto my, on my website. So I have a free download section. I make these into PDFs and I just share them. And I work mostly in black and white now. I use speedball nibs, speedballs mostly because I, I, I'm not so interested in sharp letters anymore. Um, and I use um, Higgins Eternal Ink, which is just really easy to use. Scan it into the computer. I will occasionally do a little bit of playing around, a little bit of adjusting in Photoshop. Um, but, and I don't make lines. I just kind of write. Um, this is one I did for a croning ceremony to be a little scroll at that. This is um, Virginia Woolf. This one I did with a pilot parallel pen. And so I write really f quite f fast. Um, and I really, again, that sense of urgency, lock up your libraries if you like. I mean, I really want it to be like, just kind of do it. And then I'm gonna share with you. So one of the things about the apologizing with calligraphy that I have to say, and I will mention again that, you know, I would encourage you to to look at your own story and your own history. But the change in my getting from feeling like I had to apologize for my calligraphy to not feeling that way had nothing to do with the lettering. The lettering stayed exactly the same, but what changed was how I looked at it. Um, so I do think that it is helpful to write and think about, to, you, you can use that as, as some help going through. And this is a quote from, I did this with a, folded pen that I made. I took a workshop with, folded pen workshop with Carol DeBosch in Boston. And um, the reason, I'm, one of the main reasons I'm sharing this, because it's a quote by Ruth Asawa, who's a sculptor. And she, there is a new book about her. Um, 
by Margaret Chase. I think it, I can't remember exactly, but it's a biography of Ruth Asawa. Her work is absolutely incredible and she's an amazing person. So I did this partly so I could just recommend that you might want to look for her book. And then this is something that I wrote about calligraphy. Um, and I'll just read it. Calligraphy is a balancing act. The pen must be controlled, but the control can't show. A critical eye is necessary to improve the letters, but it can't crush their spirit. The 26 letters need to be a personal expression at the same time their history and legacy are honored. We all have to find, we all find our own way to walk this line. Your pictures are over the top of it, so I'm having her. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing. If I can find my mouse. Oops. And why is this doing this? Okay, my screen is paused. I don't want to do that anymore. Let me try this. I will just, while I thought I would be looking at you while I'm saying this, but I do want to say that, um, as I said, I'm hoping that you will look at this as a, as a possibility of a starting point for you to look at your own work, um, because I think there is a lot that we can learn. And um, now I'm just going to be quiet and really figure out where this thing is. I don't usually use a laptop, and so I am. Susan, are you trying to stop sharing? I am trying to stop sharing. Okay, let me see if I can Can you do that for that. me? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to see if I can interrupt that. And it might look funny for a minute, and then I'll, I'll stop sharing. How's that? That's great. Okay, great. I think. Let me just get rid of Okay. I've got something on my screen. Um, that doesn't look like mine. So can you, uh, but there I am on the screen. Yeah, so. there you go. So anyway, I just will mention that I do have a website, susangaylord.com. I have the free downloads on there. I have a bookstore, which has my, my, the calligraphy book, my spirit books catalog, those things on it. And um, I'm, I'm making a postcard with the calligraphy quote that I read at the end, that if, if you do decide to go to the bookstore and you do decide to buy one of the books, let me know that you were in the workshop and I'll send you one of those along with it. And there is a PDF for you that has a series of writing prompts if, to sort of get you started if you want to think about your own story. Um, and my website also has links to a blog. I have a blog. I have YouTube bookmaking videos. Um, and I'm very active on Facebook if, if that's something that interests you. So if anybody has any questions. Um, so what questions do you have for Susan? And I'm going to uh, share the um, PDF prompts in the chat. So you should be able to click that. And I think this is something we can also include in the uh, follow-up email from the Guild as well. So I would say, uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Trish Meyer is asking, what are you working on now? What's next for you? Um, well, I'm doing a series of bookmaking videos, which I've recorded, but I'm, I'm doing, felt like I really needed to do something. So I've done a series of bookmaking videos kind of in response to the pandemic of giving people something to do, not just something to make, but using simple materials and making books that you can use, like kind of like you can't give somebody a hug now, you can't go to a funeral, you can't do so books to commemorate, celebrate, reach out to people. Um, so I'm working on that. I'm taking a class this summer with Helen Hebert on paper and light, which I'm really excited about because that's kind of I've, something I've always wanted to work on. And um, I'm looking forward to just kind of playing around with calligraphy again. One of the things I do is if just if things kind of like I'm, I've got some words I've collected that I want to do something with. Wonderful. No more questions in the chat. If anybody would like to unmute themselves, feel free to do that. Esther, I notice you're unmuted. Do you have a question for Susan? Well, I want to thank you for 
all you've said, it's um, heartwarming because I've gone through a similar series of teachers and interests and studies and, and um, I like that you've put it into a context for me, uh, particularly the part about calligraphers being the most critical of ourselves. Um, it explains a lot to me um, because I know I've done occasional stunningly beautiful work, but nobody sees it and nobody knows about it because I think, well, not good enough yet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I appreciate all of these diverse things from my background coming together and what you've talked about. Well, thank you. And one of the things I think, the whole thing of, like I said, I put my, like, the whole thing of, like, when do you put yourself out there and what's too soon? But there is a thing that I think if you are, like, yes, it was too soon, but it made me work, like, really hard. I mean, I was just, I worked like an app. When I realized that my work wasn't as good as it should have been, I just worked so hard. But the thing is, sometimes if you're, if you're not, I, don't, I wasn't impetuous. I just, if you weren't, if you're, you need a little bit of, of um, ignorance to sort of throw yourself out on the world. And if you've got that, like it does get you out there. And sometimes if you, the more you know, the harder it is to do that, to put yourself out there. And, and, and then, you know, I'm, I, then that's not good either. It's very freeing in what you've said. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Esther. Does anyone else have a question for Susan? Okay. Have you stopped making the spirit books? I haven't. I'm actually still making those. So I, I did, yeah, I didn't say that. So I, I went back. So I stopped in 2005 and I went back in 2010. So I've been making them since I'm actually on 102. Um, so I'm looking forward, actually, that's another thing about what I'm looking, I'm looking forward to, I've got a couple, I kind of, because I let them just, I don't want to force them. So I've got, I will just kind of get one sort of going and just leave it, like sit it out there and walk by it a whole lot until I'm ready. But I am, I've got one or two that I'm, that I'm ready to start on. And then the, the, I put them on the kind of the bases that I make from binders board, which are, which is like a completely different process because it's, it's, um, it actually needs to be straight and it needs to be a lot of things. And so I have those kind of looming at the end when, <laughs> after all the fun parts done, I know that, that that's the final stage. We have a lot of wonderful um, comments in the chat. Uh, Leanne is saying, Susan left us speechless. Neela is saying, at one point you did some writing on your slat books. Have you completely stopped writing in your natural books? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I haven't. So the spirit books have no text in them at all. And, and I don't think ever will and won't. I mean, they are what they are. Um, and why am I... I feel like I'm working on something. One of the things I've kind of figured out too, like the spirit books are ongoing and I hope to make those for as long as I can. Um, but the, um, but some of the other things is like, yeah, it, I don't have to make them forever. They can be a finite series and then I can move on to something else. Like the words for our time. I mean, they were eight and they were hard because it was, I had to find enough, at least I think six or seven quotes on that topic that fit with the feeling I wanted. And so there were words that were great words, but I just couldn't find enough. And I wanted every quote to be, I wanted to make sure I could find a, an attribution for every quote so that, because there's so much on the internet, that's just not real. I mean, you know, people either put it, gave it to the wrong person, completely make it up. So I wanted to make sure that I could trace it back to exactly where that came from. So that limit, there were a few really great quotes that just weren't real. <laughs> so Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Trish says, your next book could be How I Fell In, Out, and In Love with Spirit Books again. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like you have quite a fan club here. Esther loves, 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 loves your spirit books. Wonderful. <laughs> Any more questions for Susan or comments? Okay. 
Okay. Well, this has been a wonderful opportunity to meet with you. I know that uh, it's not under the best circumstances, but how fortunate are we <laughs> to have this opportunity to come into, that you came into our homes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so there are some benefits to be able to get to uh, continue to, um, to learn from you. And we really appreciate it. And we would love to um, have you back in New Mexico for sure. We'd love for you to experience it here. A uh, couple, one more thing in the chat here for from Michael, how do you find the attributes for your quotes? Um, I try to look up the quote again. Well, one of the things I find that wiki quotes, if you look up wiki quotes, they will tell you, they pretty much, I don't think they put any quotes there. There's, there'll be some quotes with pictures kind of at the beginning of it, but if you go down, every quote there has an, like, will tell you what it's from, what the book it's from, something. Um, there are a couple of sites which I can't remember exactly. But there's some quotes, there's a couple sites that are there to sort of ferret out what's a good, to find the ones that are wrong that will, they'll kind of give a history of why it's misattributed or something, but I can't remember. But I think that wiki, so a lot of times I'll, what I'll do is I'll type in the quote, the person, the quote, and maybe write source or something and see. But like Goodreads, um, a lot of the, the quote sites don't tell you where they come from. Hmm. I mean, I don't go to the point of having to find the book and actually see it in there. But if somebody says this came from this, th that's good enough for me. But I do find, I think I would suggest wiki quotes is the, the, the best one. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Susan. If no one has any other questions, we want to thank you for being with us this evening and, um, and taking the time to share your book. We've shared that in the chat uh, along with links. And if there's anything else you'd like to add, feel free to let us know um, in the chat if you have anything you want to copy and paste there. We have also included the uh, PDF for writing prompts. So we hope that everybody has an opportunity to reflect on their work and their calligraphy. Is there anything else, any last things you would like like to say or advice you'd like to give us as we um, move back and focus back onto our calligraphy? I mean, I guess the one thing I would say is that, you know, it's, there, there's much, it's not just technical and it's not just what you can, it's not just what you can do, but there's a, there's a whole lot of kind of a whole emotional journey that goes along with it. And I feel like I am, I mean, I just feel really fortunate that I have been able to be an artist because um, I think I'm a, it, it's not always easy, but I do feel that there's a lot I learned from it that's helped me in my life. Um, and a lot of this sort of trying to let go things, living in the moment, all of those kind of lessons. Um, I don't always do it, but I do try to apply it. And um, so I think we're all, we're all lucky that we found a passion. <laughs>